Hey there guys, my name is Siobhan Fallon. I'm an army spouse and an author, and I thought I'd change things up a little bit today. When we talk about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, we usually focus on Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer and the Lakota and Cheyenne warriors who bested him that day. Sometimes some of us talk about the widows like Libby Custer, but we don't often look at the lives of the mothers who lost so many sons. So I wanted to read a letter written by Jerusha Sturgis. Now, Jerusha was herself an army spouse, and her son Jack fell with Custer's column on June 25th, 1876. She visited the battlefield two years after the fight, and there were still bones of the dead littering the field. So you can imagine she wrote quite a letter about her experience and travels there, and she also touches on some of the controversies surrounding the fight itself. So thanks for joining me and let's hear what Jerusha had to say. Let's start with just a little bit of biographical information. Colonel Samuel Davis Sturgis was the actual commander of the 7th Cavalry Regiment. Sturgis had had a long, if not somewhat uneven, military career. He graduated from West Point in 1846 served in the war with Mexico in 1848, fought on the frontier in the early 1850s, served with the Union Army during the Civil War, and finally joined the 7th Cavalry in 1869. In 1851, he had married Jerusha Wilcox. He and Jerusha would have six children together. Nina, James, who was known as Jack, Ella, Sam Jr., Mary Agnes, or Mamie, and Thomas. Baby Thomas died when he was five years old. Colonel Sturgis was on detached service at the Cavalry Depot in St. Louis when the 7th Cavalry, under the acting command of Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, participated in the Centennial Campaign of 1876. Unfortunately for the Sturgis family, their son, 2nd Lieutenant, James Garland Sturgis, or Jack, West Point class of 1875, rode with Custer's column at the Little Bighorn. He was the youngest officer in the regiment. Jack was killed in action with E Company, and his body was never positively identified. Jerusha visited the battlefield in August 1878. She wrote this letter two years later to a family friend, and it was printed in the Summit County Beacon newspaper in Akron, Ohio in 1880. Dear Daniel, once you asked me to give you some idea of my trip to the Custer battlefield. At that time, I did not feel like it, but now I can write it and give you some idea perhaps. It has been made a national cemetery lately I believe the government is doing something towards fixing it, but I, for my part, would like it to remain just as it is, a monument to that terrible day. For what difference does it make to them now if their poor bones are bleaching in the sun and knocking about, blended with the bones of horses, pieces of clothing, and occasional Indian relics dropped on that day in their fearful contest, all one mass of confusion and chaos? In the first place, I did not go there with any idea of looking to find my dear boy or anything that had ever belonged to him. The papers got hold of something of that kind that I was, quote, looking for the remains of my son on the battlefield. And of course it went round the papers as all such sensational items do go. But I had always felt that I would like to see the spot where they all wrestled and died was such a terrible foe against them. We were at Fort Lincoln that summer with little to do. My husband was in the field with his regiment and Sam accompanied him for the summer. That left Ella, Mamie, and myself free to come and go as we pleased. Boats were running to Fort Kehoe and although a tedious trip, we conceived the idea of going 
or at least making the attempt. The river was very low. We were two weeks on a boat and met with almost hairbreadth escapes in the different rapids. Two boats came very near, coming down on us and crushing us while we were in the Buffalo Rapids aground. We were five days around there. The fare was miserable on the boat, so you can imagine it was many a weary day before we reached Keogh. Finally, however, we arrived. General Miles and other officers met us at the boat with carriages, and we were taken to the post to General Miles's house. I had entertained Mrs. Miles and her sister, now Mrs. Don Cameron, the summer before for some days at Fort Lincoln, so I was very happy to accept their kind hospitality. We were within five days before starting for the battlefield and became thoroughly rested. A large party from Keogh of about 15 officers and ladies, including General and Mrs. Miles, escorted by a hundred picked men, were getting ready for a trip to the Yellowstone Park, so we accompanied them as far as the battlefield. They were extremely anxious that we should go to the park, but we had not gone for that purpose and preferred going only as far as the battlefield. They had a string band along and everything to make it gay. I felt anything but gay and only wanted quiet and communion with myself. They were very kind and lovely to us. After we reached the Valley of the Rosebud, they suppressed the music in camp in evenings entirely on our account. We had traveled over the most dreadful bad lands before we struck the valley. Sometimes it would take four men at each wheel to let our ambulance down some of those terrible declivities. It was very hard on the nerves, but I stood it very well. Not one word of complaint ever fell from my lips, for were we not going to see where our poor Jack died. We were passing over the self-same route Custer with his troops had passed, so I felt all the time like I was with them. We were struck by the Valley of the Rosebud, the most beautiful valley I ever saw. You cannot imagine our feelings. We camped there, and the loveliest rainbow appeared over our camp. I felt it was a bow of promise and was more fully inspired to keep up my strength and spirits. Then we came across the place where Sitting Bull had had his last sun dance, before he went to where he made his stand and where our forces attacked. I lived over their whole march. At last we reached the Little Bighorn, and as we drove through its clear and limpid stream, not knowing whether our poor boy's remains were washed in it or what had become of them, yet surely it was classic ground. We all in our carriage sobbed and cried as if our hearts would break. We knew we were coming soon to the dreadful place. The little bighorn at that season was as clear as crystal and at the bottom we could see the loveliest little pebbles, agates, etc. It was quite deep only a few places where we could ford in a strong current. We crossed and drove at once to what was the Indian village and encamped. There were many of the stakes there on which teepees had been stretched, but it was a lovely spot, a plain of something over two miles on the banks of the beautiful stream I have described. In the distance, on a very high hill, can now be seen Fort Custer. It is 14 miles from there, a very good road. Oh, if it had only been a fort then, but it was wild, wild country, so far from everything, no Fort Custer, no Fort Keogh, only the wild wilderness. How wrong to penetrate so far without an immense force. It had taken us five days to go from Kehoe to the battlefield, on the south side of the river and over the Badlands. On the north side, it can be made in less time, and it's a better road. But that brings one to Fort Custer first, and then from there you drive out to the battlefield. But General Miles preferred going the way the troops had gone, and I liked it better, as I could more fully realize everything by following them just as they went at that time. Some of the scenery after we left the Badlands was the prettiest I have ever seen, perfectly grand. At times we would seem way above everything and would look down on the most beautiful valleys. The scenery on the Hudson does not compare with the beauty and grandeur of what we saw for days on that trip. 
in the Rosebud Valley and the Valley of the Little Bighorn. We drove into camp where we found a party from Fort Custer had been sent out to meet us. Captain Rawal, who was during the war on the general staff, his wife and an escort of about 15 men. Their tent was pitched and they took me right into it away from the crowd. It made it quite pleasant to meet old friends and kind, sympathizing ones too. They had everything for our comfort. A nice dinner was cooking, lemonade, tea, and everything nice for us. Comfortable bed for me to lie down in. This party had come to stay with us for as long as we wanted to stay in the field. General Miles and party were going the next morning. Colonel Buell, in command at Fort Custer, had sent them out to meet us and stay with us as long as we desired. Captain Rawal belonged to the 2nd Cavalry. We kept very quiet that evening. Next morning, the large party went on. We then had a quiet opportunity to go about and see everything and think of everything that had passed there and of our poor boy. We drove up on the Reno Hill Ella rode up on horseback, just where the troops ran that day. It was very steep, but I drove around back and on to the hill. It was the first ambulance or carriage over the hill. After surveying that, we drove over to Custer's Field. There is a point, a little higher between Reno's Hill and Custer's, so that although they were both on very high points, they could not see each other. You will understand, we forded the river and crossed to the other side to go to the Reno Hill. We were encamped in what was the Indian village. As I drove from where Reno and his command had been, over to where Custer was found, I was very much excited. As we reached the battlefield proper, we began to see bones of all kinds, half-buried bodies, clothes sticking out from under the ground, pieces of cups, canteens, horses' hoofs, everything that you can imagine. There seemed to be some kind of regularity where the companies fell. There would be quite a line of bones and bodies buried and then stragglers back to the next company where some had run back to the next and been killed as they ran. Then we would come to another company in line and then again stragglers from there back and so on, until we came to the knoll where Custer and so many officers were found. One side of them, and in a direct line, a company had fallen, then low down toward the river, and in a sort of gorge, another company had fallen, and there seemed to have been the last killed. That company was the White Horse Troop, and poor Dear Jack belonged to it. This gorge extended down to the river, and if any of them could have gotten down through that to the river and in the bush, they might have possibly made their way, hiding down the river and reached Terry, who was coming up with a large force. That is the only way one could have gotten away that day. We had four hostile Indians with us who had been in the battle, and were prisoners at Keogh. General Miles brought them along to give us information. They stood with us on the hill, and one of them had a most fiendish gloating expression, seeming to remember the glory to them of that day. Another one, I thought, looked a little sorry as he looked at poor Jack's picture. Indians, you know, are to all appearances imperturbable, but this was an exception. He seemed sorry and looked very downcast. They told us the white horses were the last engaged, but how much of what they said was true we cannot tell, yet it all seemed plausible with what we had before us. Where Custer was, you could see for miles and miles, see the whole Indian village and way down the river. You could see if Terry was coming and in sight and up a long distance, only the hill between prevented seeing the point to where Reno had escaped. I think now that Reno 
should have made more effort to sally out from where he was than he did. He should have at least tried, and that might have frightened the Indians so that they would not have quite killed everybody. But the other party was busy saving themselves, that is, Reno's part of the command. Custer should never have divided them. He was very ambitious and anxious to do a great deal alone, as it were. His favorites were with him, and if they had been successful, the more honor to that part. One thing is certain, Custer was too rash, too careless of men's lives who were entrusted to him. I could form no idea of where poor Jack fell unless with the White Horse Troop, and so I thought of his poor bones as there. How true it all is, or how it all happened, we can never, never know, till the last trump shall sound on that great resurrection day. Oh, it would be such comfort to me to know where he fell, and at what time in the engagement. I shall always blame those who threw them in the ground, for it was not burying, that they did not look more carefully for his remains. The truth was, they were all so frightened for themselves, for fear of the Indians would come back. General Terry's command had then come up, and they and Reno's buried them. They were so frightened they just hustled the bodies into the ground anyway, not half covered, and did not really take the time and pains to look for the bodies of those not found right away with Custer and near there. <sighs> Do you see how they could ever look us in the face? I don't. We stayed there the most of two days, and then went into Fort Custer, where we remained for five days, the guest of the Rawals, when we went back to Fort Kehoe on the north side of the lines, accompanied by Mrs. Rawal and two or three officers, and an escort of the Second Cavalry, commanded by Captain Mix. At Fort Keogh, we took the boat for our home, Fort Lincoln, and arrived there after just six weeks' absence. I have always felt better for the trip, and never sorry I went. I would like to go again some day. Colonel Buell at Fort Custer was exceedingly kind to us, as also General Miles at Fort Keogh, giving us escorts in each direction and entertaining us most hospitably but I felt when my own life blood was sacrificed, it was little else the government could do than to give me the facilities for going to and from the places. Still, it was all done in the most kind and gentlemanly manner. I am afraid I have tired you. Yours, Judy Sturgis, Fort Meade, May 1880. There's a story that this grave was erected in order to hide from Mrs. Sturgis that her son's body had never been found. But as you can all tell from the letter I just read, Jerusha does not mention any grave for 2nd Lieutenant Jack Sturgis at the battlefield during her visit. This is a photo of the current Sturgis marker at the battlefield. Jack's body was not identified, but his bloody underclothes and his blood-stained shirt with two bullet holes through it had been found in the Indian camp. And though Jerusha is critical of the 7th Cavalry for not searching harder for her son's body, there's some evidence that the 7th may have been shielding her from more gory details. Three different soldiers claim to have recognized Jack's decapitated head in the village, found with other decapitated and badly burned heads. So Jerusha did bring back a few mementos from the battlefield, and you can see some of them there in that framed picture. The native grasses with the painted grave, uh, kepi, and cavalry saber. And that's at the Villa Louis Historic Site in Wisconsin. 
and then the grave there is that of Sam and Jerusha at Arlington National Cemetery. Ha! Ah, I have been wanting to give voice to the mother of a soldier ever since I wrote my collection of short stories, you know when the men are gone, and I had tried to write a short story from a mother's point of view and I couldn't get it right. So this letter was really meaningful to me and thank you so much for listening guys. Thank you especially to living historian, little bighorn scholar, author and friend Bill Rinney for first sharing Jerusha's letter with me. Thanks also to historian Jeff Wall who's currently working on a book about the Sturgis family and he shared some antidotes and images with me and it's going to be incredible. I hadn't heard anything that he was telling me about so he's found a treasure there and is sharing it with us. Uh, thank you also to Dale Cosman once again for being my ultimate fact checker and a great friend. Ha! Ah, so thanks subscribers. You're wonderful. You say such nice things to me. Thank you. And those of you who haven't subscribed yet, please do. Uh, I have tons more of course in my head and hopefully I'll get them out into the world soon. So put your little bell on so you get the notifications. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comment section below. And I hope to see you guys again soon. Thank you so much. Have a great day.